The journey in terms of my affirmation of my identity is, was not really like a clear cut point in time. Um, but I do remember that just growing up that I always preferred to play with boys. The freest times of my life um, was when I was outdoors, just being a kid, rollerblading. My father actually um, did the farm work program for quite some years, about 10 years, um, in my young, about from the age of 5 to 15. And so one year he bought me some rollerblades. And I think that summer was one of the best times of my life because I was able to just be outdoors with my friends. And it was a really good experience in that, you know, I don't think I was seen as my sex or my gender. I was just a kid. Um, but I do realize that the boys, you know, didn't like when I beat them rollerblading, you know. So I think all those, there are a lot of individual moments that come together defined who I was as a person. So you were like a tomboy? Yeah. One thing that I was always certain of was my sexuality. Like I knew who I was attracted to. But I never really thought about, and even in my teenage years, I never even thought about my sexuality either. For me, it was just, you know, school. Um, I enjoyed what I, I liked, what I liked in terms of social activities. But I think internally, I knew who I was. Mm -hmm. But I came to a point where I realized that the external world didn't see me as I saw myself. I never thought that there was any possibility to, to be anything else than what my body, that what, what my body presented to the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, so even though your gender identity is not necessarily your, um, what your body looks like, it's about your internal sense of your gender, meaning how you see yourself defines your identity. Even when I chose the name Nick as my secret name for myself, mm -hmm. I never really put the pieces together that, you know, this was a way that I was kind of trying to connect with another part of myself that I didn't give myself a chance to explore. Over time, into my 20s, I made like s small steps. So like my girlfriend at the time, she's not my wife. At that time, I was moving to the US for a fellowship. Mm -hmm. And when I left Jamaica, you know, um, even before then too, I always had a lot of anxiety around shopping in Jamaica. And I remember when I moved to DC and, you know, I told my partner that, you know, I want, I made a conscious decision that I want to wear masculine clothing. You know, so it was a gradual process of affirming myself um, and to the point where I was like, you know, I've always thought about what life would look like or what I would look like if I had access to like top surgery. So I think um, in the last five years especially, I've been able to really to kind of like just take a step and just really think about who I am and what would make me happy. The first thing actually was my name. Even before a legal name change was to say, hi, this is the name that I, I choose and this is how I'd like to be addressed. And these are the pronouns that, was that in I the use. States, still in the States? No, that's when I came back to Jamaica. I was only in the US for two years. Okay. I used niche as my name yes. from, from then. But I'm, I still use female pronouns, or you know, um, I still identified at that time as a, as a lesbian. Mm -hmm. Even though the word lesbian never really felt right to me, I didn't have another word, so I would typically prefer to say gay mm -hmm. as an umbrella word mm -hmm. um, to, to express my um, sexuality. But that, again, is separate from my identity, because your sexuality and identity are two separate things. Uh, when I came out to Jamaica in 2014, I, I've always like been very involved in like social activism, like finding different ways to like volunteer or, or connect with community. So like for example, for JFLAG, I've always like been on their social media pages, commenting or you know just participating in discourse. Especially because people who comment generally on JFLAG's social media pages have a lot of negative things to say, mm -hmm. and there are sometimes limited positive comments, um, especially back then. And so when I came out to Jamaica, I wanted to be a little bit more involved in advocacy here. And that's how Transwave was actually born from that workshop that We Change and JFLAG had hosted in 2015. Transitioning is not just about um, the person who is transitioning, mm -hmm. and whether it's medically or socially, but it has a lot to do with the people around. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about you know telling somebody the name that you want to go by, what pronouns to use. And then it's about even if, if, you're, if you have family, it's also about, you know, um, coming out again, right? Because I've mm -hmm. come out before, before, right? So it's about coming out again to your family members to let them know, you know, this is how you identify, this is how you'd like to be referred to, this is, these are your pronouns. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes people like to say preferred pronouns, but they are not really preferred. They are just your pronouns. It's mm -hmm. how you identify. Um, so 
after that, I, I thought about like top surgery, you know, the possibility of it. I thought about hormone replacement therapy, if mm -hmm. it was something that could be accessible. I didn't here in Jamaica? Here, yes, yes. No, I thought, just thought about it in general. Okay. Like, if it's something that I would like, if it's something that was a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, so researching it, of course, would mean that any information that comes up, you won't find anything in Jamaica about mm -hmm. um, medical transitioning. So I did I have a, had a friend who um, is a trans masculine person, um, yeah, and they, they're not living, they're from the Caribbean, but they live in the US. Mm -hmm. And so they shared with me some resources that I could like, access mm -hmm. to find out about surgery options. Mm -hmm. um, so I just kind of started doing some research, seeing what it would cost, um, you know, seeing what the possibilities are, you know, what are some of the, like, the effects of um, taking testosterone, what would it do to your body, etc., etc. I'd gone to a conference called BTAC, Black Trans Advocacy Conference, um, one year, it was hosted in States? Dallas, yeah, okay. hosted in <laughs> Dallas. And what I loved about that conference is because it highlighted the experiences of trans masculine and trans feminine people and non-binary people who are black. Being able to interact and like, build community with so many trans masculine people mm -hmm. um, in the south of the US, which is not known to be very you know, liberal, um, was a really great moment for me. And so that's when I was like, all right, I think that was 2016, mm -hmm. I think. And I was like, you know, like, this, this looks possible. Mm -hmm. This looks like, you know, how I could like, envision myself uh, being authentic. I started hormones here in Jamaica, okay. right? So it's not something I access overseas. Okay, um, so doctors here gave it to you? Yeah, um, so private. private, yes. Because it's not, unfortunately, um, HRT is not accessible um, in public health spaces. So another trans friend of mine who I'm very close to um, found a doctor who was um, very willing. Yeah, willing and in a safe way like you know as a, a, as a provider who provides HR um, or hormones or testosterone typically to cisgender men so men who are assigned male at birth and identify as men and need testosterone for, for multiple reasons right. Mm -hmm. December 2016 Started I started taking you still so had your breast, breast yes you still I hadn't had top time. surgery or anything yet um, so I started and yeah like my voice I like to think that my voice has not changed much like okay. it's not deep I don't think so right okay. but I try not to dwell on like depth because there's just it, it plays into the expectation that cis heteronormativity so like in the idea that you know uh, masculinity is tied to certain things like a deep voice or like beard or mm -hmm. muscle or whatever. Now clearly there are certain things that you know as a trans masculine person you you would like in terms of like when you look at yourself in the mirror mm -hmm. or what you envision as just yourself in your head that you try to you like you want to see reflected um, but you also also want to try to separate it from playing into masculinity that can become toxic. You know my voice started to deepen because I did a uh, attract my medical transition for one year so see my, my, my change in my voice and definitely like my voice was way higher mm -hmm. um, so almost three years on testosterone my voice is a lot deeper mm -hmm. than it used to be I mean I do my, my, my features are different mm -hmm. and even just my physique I've always been an active person mm -hmm. um, so like I'm always playing sports and stuff so like muscle is not something that I'm not used to but I definitely have a way easier time now like developing muscle mass. So I had top surgery one year after I started HRT. You know, as a man, you know, there are sometimes things that you, you kind of want for yourself, right? Some people want a car, yeah. right? Some people want to buy a house or whatever. For me, like, top surgery was my investment. Yeah, I wanted a chest. So that's what I wanted, right? Yeah. Um, so I say for it. Um, it and it, it was cheaper than a car too, actually, right? Um, Do you mind saying sure, it was. It and everything like the surgery, like the flights, um, I had to stay for a little while, um, anesthesia, blah blah blah, came up to about ten thousand US, a little bit less than ten thousand US. Some people spend, you know, thirty thousand US on a vehicle. I mean, so. Did, did you did you do? Bottom surgery. I'm assuming that's what it's called. It's, it's called top you're, surgery. You catch on pretty well. Did you do bottom right, surgery? So, that's one thing that I won't uh, discuss. Well, you um, know bottom surgery. I'm sure. I'm sure. But ask. the reason why I, I I don't discuss all all of my body for multiple reasons. One, because there's this idea that to be to be a man, your body has to look a particular way, and so it plays into this idea, and it also um, fetishizes 
trans bodies. Mm -hmm. Like this idea that people just need to know what's in your pants or what, what your body looks like naked. Of course, you know, but unless somebody is looking to date me, mm -hmm. right? That's, or if somebody's my, my doctor that needs, and, and it can, not any doctor even, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends on the type of service the doctor is providing. That's the only reason why those people may need to even know. Um, and not everybody who you're even dating should even have access to that information, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, a man who is dating a cisgender man, right? If they're dating a woman, um, I don't think a lot of women are going to write off the bat. Some people yeah. will, will say, hey, so what size penis you have, right? No, people, you know, that's yeah. not going to be the topic of conversation. So yeah. it therefore should not be a question that trans people should be forced to answer. At the end of the day, my, my parents, I know that they love me. You know, mm -hmm. they might not totally understand me, mm -hmm. you know, but, and, and I think a lot of times, so even as they try to understand or they struggle to understand, a lot of the struggle actually is to do with other people. That mm -hmm. has created additional tension over the years. Um, but, you know, the fact is I'm, I'm pretty grown, you know, I'm in my 30s mm -hmm. now, regardless of whatever struggles I've had with my family, that I'm very fortunate to still have them in my life. In, even, you know, even some of the extended family, I, don't, I might not talk to my extended family as often, um, but I know that if I, if I do need something, I can count on my, my family, you know, I can count on my immediate family, and definitely count on my mother, I know that for 100%. My father and I are very similar, so we've had, you know, we've had our, our ups and downs, but I think part of that is not even necessarily only to do with my, my identity, or my, my, trans, my transition, but just also because no, no matter what, parents and kids have, have moments, right? No matter if it's your, your identity, your sexuality, because of your, your you know, just your, your opinions that you have, your, your values, whatever it is, there are certain challenges that might come up um, with family. Transitioning is such a personal thing. And a lot of trans people, actually, relationships don't last through transition, right? Because um, if, you're, if you're, you're in a, what's considered a lesbian relationship, if somebody medically transition and is a man, right, and, and that person is with, the other person who didn't transition is now with a man and identifies as a lesbian, mm. that's, that's complicated, it's right? Right? Yeah, but, but sexuality is not, is, is complex. You know, nothing is so black and white. My partner is very supportive and so, you know, I feel very fortunate to have somebody like that by my side who supports my medical transition and my social transition in that way. I'm very happy. Like, I think if I could be, I would be happier if I could see a vision of Jamaica that more of my community could have the same access and support that I had. That it doesn't have to take a struggle and that um, people don't have to overcome other certain challenges that are really should not be a barrier to them being happy. On any given day, you get up and you look in the mirror and you say, this might be a mistake. Ah, <laughs> never. Even this morning, I looked in the mirror and I was like, I am f***ing hot. Like, I really cherish what I call my queerness, like my queer identity, as somebody who is not a non-cis person. And so, which is why I would never be, I guess what you call stealth, or like, as move through the world and not let people know that I'm trans, right? Mm -hmm. However, I do understand why it's absolutely critical for people, for some people, to be stealth because of the safety reasons. There's so much hate, right, and so much violence towards trans people around the world, particularly trans women, right? And it's very unfortunate that. Um, I will have a great, a, a better perceived chance of success because of how I look, because of um, people think, okay, so you know, he fits in, he blends in, and that, that devalues so much the experiences of so many other trans people who are non-binary, who are non-conforming, trans women who don't want to access hormones, um, trans people who can't access hormones, so people who have, won't have the, the luxury of having surgery. And so it means that trans people are still on the margins, are still vulnerable, you know, are still lacking in opportunities. And so that's why I'm very passionate about the work that I do. I wouldn't want to blend into corporate Jamaica, mm -hmm. you know, because that's not where my, my passion is. And so if I can use my platform, you know, and, and I work very hard 
you know, at what I do with Transweight. And so it's very critical for me that there are other people who can access opportunities, services, support, who have family support, who have opportunities to flourish, to have employment, you know, to have housing. Trans people aren't villains, you know, like we as a community um, are as Jamaican as anybody else. Our identities are valid. As Jamaicans, we have overcome so much as a country and as a people. Trans people shouldn't have additional hurdles to overcome just to live. We're, so many trans people are not even at, at the point of thriving, right? And so I think for me, I just would like for people to be a bit more compassionate. We should be celebrating diversity. It's not only about, you know, we, we, we shouldn't only stop at the point of tolerance, you know? Because we should really be celebrating the different people who make up our country and respect them and what they can contribute to our na to nation building. Because I know that I know um, a lot of trans people, right? And they are some of the fiercest people that I know. And for me, when I see them, I just want to be able to continue this work to ensure that we advance um, our, our rights and be able to change our name as smoothly as we can. You know, like change our, our gender markers and our IDs, you know, and not worry about the anxiety that it can cause. I barely remember like my body before medical transition, truly. Yeah, so that, that was like a highlight of my journey. And so I think for me, what I hope to do sometime, sometime in the future is to be able to help other people access surgery.